Good afternoon and welcome to today's Ad Week webinar, the CMO's Guide to Digital Transformation in 2022, sponsored by Delve. I'm Melissa Ward, Managing Editor of Branded Content at Ad Week, and I'll be your host today. Before we begin, I want to take a moment to make sure everyone knows what to expect from today's webinar and is familiar with the features of our platform. The actual presentation should go somewhere in the 40-minute range, after which we'll have some time for audience Q&A. So, if at any point you have a question, just use the Q&A tool on the left side of your screen, and we'll get to as many questions as we can after the end of the presentation. Also, it's not too late to invite your colleagues to join us at today's webinar. About 15 minutes ago, you received a final reminder email from us. In there, you'll find a link to the webinar registration page, and you can share that with your colleagues. There's still plenty of time for them to join us live, but if they can't, we understand. Today's webinar is being recorded and they can always catch the on-demand version. In fact, the on-demand recording is available to all of our registrants. We'll be sending you a link later today when it's live around 3.30 Eastern. And if you'd like a PDF of today's slide tech, you'll find it in the event resources tab at the top of your screen. As always, if you enjoy today's webinar, definitely check out the full Adweek webinars calendar at adweek.com slash webinars. You'll see what we have coming up, and you'll also get access to our archive of on-demand webinars. Now, before we jump into the presentation, let me take a moment to introduce you to our speaker. We're happy to be joined by Greg Sobiek, founder and global CEO of Delve an international digital consulting firm specializing in data-driven marketing transformation and measurement-first media activation. We have got some great content to dive in today, so let me take a moment to bring Greg up on screen and we'll get started. Hello, Melissa. Thank you for having me. And thank you, everyone, for joining our presentation today. Uh, like Melissa was saying, we'll discuss today the application of data-driven marketing in transformation. Now, I wanted to make a couple points before we get started. I want to make sure that today's presentation is as pragmatic and practical as possible. How I define success for today's meeting is if you can walk away with one tangible idea that you can implement in your business tomorrow through the rest of the year and as you think about your 2023 planning, then I think I have succeeded. So I hope that that one key idea will jump out at you in the course of this presentation. But there is also another point that I would like to make which I think is quite obvious, but sometimes it is good to restate the obvious. In marketing, it is our role to think about our brand's unique value proposition and to think about the customers that are the best match to that unique value proposition. I think about marketing as a study of the kinds of things that we should do and the kinds of customers that we should target because our brand is the best fit for those customers. And it's also about knowing what our brand does not stand for and who are the kinds of customers that we should be targeting. The reason why I'm restating what really is, I think, quite obvious is because today's presentation, although it's structured as a discussion about the role of first party data, I am going to make an argument that properly utilized First party data is about doubling down on our best customers. It is about maximizing digital performance and growing our revenues faster than our competitors, exactly because we understand our unique value proposition and who our best customers are. And first party data is simply an engine that can get us there. Now, if you look at the next slide, Here's what we're going to do today. We're going to review a survey that we commissioned earlier in the year where we asked over 300 CMOs about the kinds of pressures that they're under and how they are addressing those pressures. And often that's with first party data projects. 
Then I'm going to share a framework with five very specific ideas that you can take and run with tomorrow. But first I'll share a bit of a context because I want to make sure that, that these ideas are relevant to specific brands that participate to this call on this call. And then we'll talk about the Q&A. And again, my name is Greg Sobiek. I'm the CEO and founder of Delve. We are a digital consultancy. We have over 140 professionals that love digital marketing and have fire in the belly, who have a growth mindset and who understand that in order to accomplish impact, we need to do fewer things really well. If you would like to get a copy of this deck or of this survey, you can email me at greg at delvedeeper.com. And if you'd like to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation about topics that I'm going to discuss today, pre please reach out to me. So earlier in this year, we commissioned a survey with over 300 marketing leaders. And the survey was conducted in mostly North America, also in Europe. These were mid-market brands with revenues between half a billion and $2 billion. Again, you can get this uh, survey on our website or email me. Now, you may work for a brand whose revenues are lower than half a billion dollars, or maybe you are working for a Fortune 500 brand. When I talk to marketers, what I find is that regardless of the revenues that they have, if they have a growth mindset and if they believe that first party data is the way to transform their marketing, the insights from this research are relevant to anyone with that approach. Now, before I go into this next slide and, and I look at the details, here is something that I found when talking to marketing leaders one-on-one -on -one in private settings. I hear two key frustrations. Number one, marketing leaders are being asked to oversee and be accountable over total revenue growth for the whole enterprise. So the whole pie, the whole revenue pie. And yet they actually have accountability over a sliver of that pie. And often that accountability is related to the kinds of marketing and advertising programs that they run. Number two, marketing leaders don't have a seat at the table. A classic situation that I'm hearing again and again is one where there is a big meeting with the board, the CEO is there, the CFO is there, but the CMO is missing in that meeting. Now, how does that relate to this graph? When we ask marketing leaders how they want to evolve and transform their career pathing, how they want to change their role, what we heard is that most marketing leaders are thinking about a role of a chief digital officer. To clarify, I don't think that this means that chief marketing officers want to become chief digital officers. I do think that chief marketing officer, officers desire to take on additional responsibilities that maybe often are under the title of a chief digital officer. So this is about broadening and increasing the depth of a job description of a typical chief marketing officer. And again, why is that important? That's important to marketing leaders because they feel that if they can broaden and deepen their responsibilities, wearing a chief digital officer hat as one of their many hats, they can maximize their impact and they can actually earn the right to have a seat at that table. Now, what are the specific projects? What are the specific responsibilities that marketing leaders want to take on when they're thinking about having more impact and earning the right to have a seat at the table? It's about data insights. It's about data analysis. And we're talking about analysis of customer data. It's about using emerging technologies like machine learning in data science projects. It's also about using data-driven marketing in marketing and advertising activities. Now, if I take a step back and I think about all of these initiatives on the screen, I would argue that each answer is its own specific project. 
And just one of these projects alone can keep a marketing leader occupied over the coming months. So is there a way to check all of these boxes and get all of these goals accomplished in one fell swoop? When I talk to marketing leaders, what comes up again and again, and that's also something that we believe here at Delve, is first party data. A foundational first party data project, a philosophy structured around first party data will address all of these objectives again in one fell swoop and all these boxes can be checked. And first party data is something that we do here at Delft. Here's an example. And I really love this picture just because of all the smiles and all the good energy. But first party data is something that we do at Delft. We are the recipient of a 2021 Ad Exchanger Award for the best first party data project that we did together with Gerber Life Insurance. And here's, here are some members of our team and Gerber Life on the stage in New York. I think this was November of last year and you know they look very happy, hopefully because of the results and, and they hopefully also had a good time together. Now, but is it about first party data? I don't think it's about first party data. I think it's about the impact that first party data can have on business outcomes. Again, this goes back again to having a seat at the table and increasing our impact in our current roles. So what are marketers saying are some of the benefits of first party data in their eyes? It's about faster decisions. It's about making decisions that translate into measurable outcomes. It's about knowing what not to do. So cutting out inefficiencies. I think that's especially important in the current economic environment when we are increasingly under pressure to do more with the same. It's about focusing on high value customers making more accurate decisions, increasing return on investments, so and so forth. So data is the how, and the value is the why. These are the reasons to do first party data projects. If we are not clear about the benefits of these projects, then maybe they're not the worthy investments for us. So to summarize the insights of our survey, and I'm jumping in a moment to specific recommendations, A, Marketing leaders are under pressure to increase total enterprise revenues, and yet they are responsible only for a sliver of those revenues. They can make impact on a sliver of overall, overall revenues, and they want to have a seat at the table. They are reacting to these frustrations by redefining their job description with a specific focus on data and technical acumen. They want to broaden their job descriptions to increase accountability and take on additional projects such as customer insights, real-time insights, leaning on data science in order to enable data-driven marketing. And finally, leaders want to utilize first-party data to make that impact and to have the right to have a seat at the table. But again, it's not about data per se. This is really about making impact with faster decisions, clarity about what works, what doesn't work. It's about focusing high value customers or ultimately increasing performance and increasing share of revenue that they can impact. Now, let's talk about the framework and the specific five ideas, but first very quickly, a number of assumptions that are relevant if you want to maximize the impact of these insights. And this doesn't have to be relevant to you, but if it is, that it would be helpful. Number one, if your brand has a small share of the addressable market and you think there is a big opportunity to increase that share, you will find this especially relevant. Number two, part of principle, you know, I, I was to, I was an econ major, so economics is, and this principle is something I've known for the last 25 years. But part of principle simply says that a subset of your customers have an outsized impact on your revenue. So if you believe that this exists in your business, this mechanic is true to your business, you will find this very relevant. Finally, I want to redefine what customer obsession is. Customer obsession nowadays is another one of those frankly buzzwords like transformation. And sometimes I myself, am not, I'm not exactly sure what it means because it can be about personalization. It can be about user experience. It's about better experiences. For the purpose of this conversation, 
I would like to argue that customer obsession is about a relentless focus and commitment to focusing on our best customers who represent a subset of our total customers. And it's about that focus and that commitment being expressed through data enablement, especially first part the data enablement, enablement and applying the principle of focusing on our best customers, leaning on first party data across all of our marketing activities. And here's the thing, it's about knowing what to do and what knowing, knowing not to do. And I'm going to illustrate this in a second. So let's get into our framework. Now, I fully recognize that I will not be able to do service to this framework in the remaining 25 minutes or so. That's why, again, if you would like to have a one-on-one -on -one chat with me, email me, greg at Delve Deeper, and I'll gladly make the time and, and just help you think through these steps. And I am absolutely going to fly through this presentation. Um, it's not overly complicated, but there is a number of complexity in some of these steps. We really have five steps. There are two uh, data. There are two data steps. Those are the green steps. We have two media activation steps and the one measurement step. Now let's go into our first step, which is collection integration of your own internal first party data. So what I often find uh, is that we have a situation where data is siloed. So it's in different environments. There is lack of trust in that data internally. Maybe the data isn't connected at one universal customer ID. And there is no easy way to export that data to media buying systems or to your POS system or to your, let's say, to search or social. And what I'm advocating for is a setup where all of your data is in one environment and those data silos are broken down. So imagine a situation where data is unified in a data lake or a CDP check, or metrics and dimensions are known and trusted. You have a universal customer ID definition internally, and you have the ability to export this data either automatically or manually to your different marketing channels. So for example, the situation we're talking about here is someone who, for example, buys a product of a specific color with a specific price point, and you think that they should get an offer for a similar product or a product that's a natural extension of that product, and that's the next best action in the customer's journey, you should have the ability to seamlessly export that data to your different channels and act on it. Now, here's an example of a screenshot from a recent project where we clearly delineate data collection and unification as a one step to enable analysis and activation. Here's another example of a project that we executed this year where I'm not going to go into all the details because it's really not relevant. But what's relevant here is that these kinds of projects are a little scary because they're a little complex, they're not inexpensive, and it's hard to know from the get-go what is the value. I am advocating for an approach where the value is imminent, where Couple months into the project, you can already deliver insights and you don't have to wait six, 12 months to deliver value. That value can be shared in the organization very quickly. So quick wins, I think it's a key concept that's relevant to this framework. Now, here's another example of a project plan. So to get the full value of a project like this, it takes about 12 months. But again, you can see here that for a recent client, we're able to deliver value within six months. And this is a real result. What was really interesting is we implemented on top of this framework, a recommendation AI engine with recommendations, product recommendations implemented in email and on the website. This recommendation engine, by the way, was owned by the client, which is also a big concept that we'll talk about, which is this is your own data. This is a project that you should be in-housing. You should not be outsourcing a project like this to a third party because data is currency. Your data is the key to your company's future growth and you owe it to yourself and your company to have this data be stored internally. But the point is that in this, in this case, we delivered a 3% lift in overall online sales for this retailer 
through a better recommendation engine, people were more likely add to cart and the AOV was higher. So that's an example of a project like this, being able to deliver tangible value. And from what I remember, this was the next number of millions of dollars in incremental value for a much, much lower investment. So the ROI was there very quickly and the quick win was there. Now, there are many steps that have to happen for a project like this to be successful. It's frankly easy to screw this up. But as marketing leaders, I believe it is our responsibility to ask key questions. We don't have to know exactly how it has to be done, but it is our responsibility to know what we want to get out of it. So I have a number of questions here. I won't have time to go through all of them. I'm going to focus on several. Again, if you would like to get a copy of this and all these questions and discuss it with me, greg at delvedeeper.com. So the first thing that I think is, is really important is having a leader on your team that understands technology and data, but that wears a marketer's hat. Now, maybe that's someone that actually used to be in marketing and now they're a technologist. Frankly, it's hard to find people like that. They almost never exist. So maybe it's also about you as a marketing leader being very clear with that partner that will lead a project like this about your requirements, about what it is that you want to get out of it. The reason why I'm stressing this point is because I've been exposed over the years to a number of projects, CDP projects, data lake projects, where someone builds an environment and then it's hard to run analysis. It's hard to connect the data. It's hard to actually use the environment. It's even harder or impossible to export data from this environment to, to other platforms. And that's really the second point that I want to make is I've seen too many projects where there is clear customer ID defined, data is trusted, the environment can be used quite easily, but it's built in a way where this environment doesn't talk to the channels where you spend most money. I'll give you a classic example. Data Lake talks to an email and SMS system. Let's say the client spends 5% of their budget and effort on email and SMM. Maybe the effort is higher than 5%, but email and SMM is, is much cheaper as channels than many other channels. And yet they, spay, they spend 70% of their budget on digital and 25% on direct mail. And it's not easy for them to export data from these systems to direct mail or to audience systems, to digital marketing audience systems. Their ability to have impact is limited. So these two points are very important. Another point, just personal perspective, I am a big believer in these systems being in-house. You don't want to be tied to a third-party vendor who may you know, disappear tomorrow or who will hold you hostage. I would insist on this data lake or CDP environment being built for, for you internally. Now, I spoke about quick wins. There is absolutely a way to get quick wins out of this exercise. So here's an example of Peter. He's an actual client at, uh, at Gerber Life who asked that we don't bring up his last name. And he has wanted to acquire net new customers to the file at his target cost per cost policy. That's a concept that is specific to the insurance industry. Think of a CPA or ROI, it's the same thing. And the answer was to build a data lake environment to do segmentation projects, propensity to buy projects and churn modeling. Each one of these projects deliver immediate increase in metrics or declines in costs. Ultimately, from an annual perspective, an investment like this for this client delivered tens of millions of dollars in incremental annual value. What was interesting is the time, time to making a decision, time to executing a project declined by 50%. Why? Well, because it's just easier now to analyze data, to find interesting, as, as, uh, interesting insights, <laughs> to collaborate internally. Um, the data science team just isn't ta spending their time trying to tie data together. They can spend time doing interesting analysis. That's why time to uh, execution is shorter. And finally, they're experiencing a 40% decrease, decrease in technology costs. You know, that's relevant if you are covering technology costs, but I think that their IT department is happy because costs for this infrastructure went down. So again, there, there's different ways 
to define value, but these are very specific examples of how a first party data project can in fact be translated into quick wins, into very specific projects that have very specific outcomes and to actually impact overall enterprise revenues. And this goes back to what I was sharing with you initially is that when I talk to marketing leaders one-on-one, -on -one, that frustration around, I need to make bigger impact and I need to earn the right to have a seat at the table. Well, if we can increase revenue in a way that's measurable by tens of millions of dollars and we can do things faster at a lower cost, that's one way to earn the right to have that seat and to maximize our impact. Now, I just spoke about step one and we have about 10 minutes left. So I'm going to walk you through the other steps. But what I would like for you to remember from this specific step is that, yes, it is an infrastructure investment. It's not a cost center if done correctly. It is simply a foundational step. It's something that you have to do in order to move forward. It's, it's a springboard for your first part data initiative, but it's not about the data lake or the CDP. It's about how to use that data to make impact. Going back to what I said initially, to understand who are our best customers truly, do they represent an outsized impact on our revenues? And how do we find people like that? That's what the next section is all about. So step number two is about actually understanding who our best customers are. And I am not going to go into technical details. It's not that relevant. What I would like for you to remember is that I think sometimes what happens is that we do segmentation projects that maybe are refreshed every quarter, every six months. And it's not a living and breathing approach. What I'm advocating for in your next year's marketing plan is that you ask your data technology, data science teams to incorporate segmentation into your weekly review process where there's this relentless pursuit to understand who are my best customers and a conversation about how I am doing in my marketing initiatives through the lens of best customers. For example, am I truly targeting my best customers and giving them special attention in my email campaign, in my direct mail projects, in my digital marketing? It is the mindset that has to change, not necessarily the approach itself. Now, do some brands truly have best customers? Is that really real? So here's a very extreme example. I picked it on purpose, I, I admit. Um, it's probably not something that we see often, but here's an example of a, a FinTech customer who um, has low value and high value customers. What we discovered is that 13% of their customers were worth 46,000 on average per year in value, sorry, over three years in value. But the remaining 87% either had negative or you know, nominal value. So this is relevant because, you know, I could make an argument that this, that this customer, uh, this marketing leader should cut 87% of their marketing budget. Obviously that's not realistic. You know, can they, there's many questions that have to be addressed in that conversation. It's not that simple, but this illustrates in a very extreme way, the fact that first party data and this kind of analysis can shed light on what is working and who we should pursue, which are these customers on the right, and what maybe isn't working, even though it seems to be working, and we should do less of it, and we should reallocate budget to the pursuit of these high value customers. Now, here's another example that I will, you probably will find is more reasonable. So here's a, a company that uh, specializes in, in uh, a recurring revenue product. And what we found surprisingly is that cluster B specifically in this case, uh, which was a specific subset of customers, there were 14% of the file were these customers and they were impacted 36% of revenue. So every customer in this cluster was worth 2.5 times more than any other customer in the file. Why was that? What we found is that these customers were very likely to sign up for a recurring subscription and they were in canceling in months two, three, and four 
and so on. So again, the recommendation here has been, and we're actually doing this right now as we go, go into Q4, is to double down on these high value customers to find more people like them with the understanding that every dollar spent on these high file customers will deliver more revenue downstream. Now, a lot has to happen in order for an initiative like this to be implemented. I have a number of questions that you should be asking across people, data tech and activation areas. The one thing I would want you to walk away with is that again, you know, people are important. They're most important. And you need to have a strong marketing minded data science leader in order to quickly generate interesting ideas that you can activate very quickly as well. Now, if you lack a marketing minded data science lead, my second best recommendation, and I think it's really good enough as well, is to create a strong collaboration with that leader where you are actually asking questions and you're in the room, not, not necessarily getting your hands dirty with the data, but you need to understand as a marketing leader who is transformational, what data is available, what it means, what it doesn't mean, and you're kind of coaching and guiding your data science team, and you are the teacher teaching them marketing and what it is that you care about. And if you do that, the impact on next year will be very clear. You are going to get faster to insights, just like I shared in that example of Gerber Life, where their time to insight and action decreased by 50%. So, so far, we spoke about two foundational data concepts. So by now, you have all of your data in one place. Those data silos are broken. You have a unified customer ID and you trust your data. That's step number one. Step number two, you have redefined who your best customers are. You are looking at your best customers, let's say on a weekly basis. You're trying to see if your share of best customers is actually increasing. If it's increasing, your total revenues will be increasing. You have a dialogue with your data science team. If you think back to what it is that marketing leaders want to accomplish to increase their impact and to have a seat at the table, you have created the foundation. So let's get into activation. Now, two things stand out for me in steps three and four. Step number three is about the audience. It's about finding people that look like your best customers out there and attracting them to your brand. But step number four, in my experience, is equally important and yet it's over overlooked. Process. How we actually execute campaigns, how we buy media in search social programmatic, how we think about audience testing in direct mail, how we think about email and text, messages on the POS. That's all about process and relentless testing and frankly, it's disappointing to see that often agencies are not that focused on the relentless pursuit of optimization. It's probably difficult, but it's necessary. But let's talk about step number three. So what I often find is that there is a separation between church and state in many companies. So there is a team that deals with data science and analytics and web analytics and databases. And there's a team that actually manages marketing budgets. And it's hard to translate insights gathered through the data team and apply them to the team that's actually sitting the tools, pushing the buttons, you know, pressing the buttons. So there's this wall between data and activation. How do we break this wall down? A, I would actually argue, frankly, that just having a report like I am just shared with you earlier is already very interesting. You can share a report like this with your team and you can talk about how do I find customers that look like this 14%. So there's a kind of a qualitative way to activate this data. It doesn't have to be solved with technology, but there's also a more systematic, scalable way to address this problem. And that's addressed with a clean room solution. Now I know that clean room is something that we hear about often. Frankly, we will not have the time to go get into it today. And, and honestly, as a marketing leader or in my current role, you know, I don't need to know all the details around how a clear, clear room is structured, for example, on this picture. 
All I need to remember is that clean room is a way for me to connect my insights about who my best customers are with the ability to actually pursue those customers in all of my marketing channels, not just those customers, because that's retargeting, but, but more importantly, and I think more interesting, interestingly to pursue customers who look like my best customers and who are in the market, who have the intent to buy from a company like mine. Now, this is one of those steps that is a little contrary to my overall belief in in housing. I'm a strong believer in in housing. Oh, I think that brands should in house as much, much of their technology and data as possible. That they should not lean on third parties that have kind of prepackaged solutions, and they should do custom development. That doesn't have to be that that hard because today, ad tech and martech are, are very much pre configured to be in house by by brands. But to have a connection with external media buying systems, you have to have a strong technology partnerships with Meta, with Google, with Amazon, with other providers. So you, you may need to work with a third party, including Delph, on a project like that. But let's remember steps one and two, your data assets. Again, I believe they should always be in-house and you should always keep them close to your chest. How you apply the data to media buying systems, you may need to partner with someone like Delph or another consultancy, because we just simply have spent thousands and thousands of hours developing, developing these data connections. So we spoke about the importance of audiences in activating your data, but there's another step. Step number four is, yes, we have the right audiences, but how do we actually spend the millions of dollars that we're the stewards for to get to squeeze maximum value from those investments? And what I often find is that marketers want to outsource the thinking to an algorithm. You know, like the classic example that I heard a couple of years ago, which frankly made me a little mad and disappointed, is that we're just going to upload a bunch of assets to Facebook and let the algorithm figure itself. That doesn't make any sense to me. I think it is very important to maximize the value of our, of our investments. And it all has to do with the mindset. I spoke earlier about the team at Delft having a growth mindset, which means we are very comfortable failing and we're comfortable being outside of our comfort zone. And I think that, that is a universal concept. I think many, many marketers and many agencies, especially, are comfortable and they don't optimize very often. I think that the right way to squeeze value from marketing investments, to squeeze every dollar, is to very intentionally, not just buy the right audiences, but to have a very clear media management process that's structured around stop, start, continue. Now, I'm aware of the fact that this maybe isn't necessarily about first party data. And it may not seem very transformative, but I think this has completely transformative. And what I would recommend, for example, on this page is that you set up a process where every month, every week, your team and your agency come to you and they share with you examples of how they're leaning on data to know what's working. So what should they continue? What's not working? What they should stop? And what they should start? What are some new ideas? So this stop, start, continue process where Every week you're asking your team, what should we stop? What should we start? And what should we continue? Where you, they, they, they need to provide you with those answers will allow you to maximize the value of step one, two, and three. And two other concepts I want to mention. One is the psychology is important here. What I find is that people have growth mindset that work for you they will embrace this philosophy. They will want to fail and see what doesn't work and succeed, be very clear about what's working. It's also about fire in the belly, just simply, you know, something I hate is, and it's not about hate, but what I don't appreciate is when someone says, well, I've done all that can be done with these marketing investments. I believe that there is always actually a way to push the envelope. There's always something else we could do to deliver better results as marketers. So. Having a growth mindset is about also having fire in the belly, that relentless pursuit of accomplishing higher and higher results. 
And how does this translate into your next year's plan with this philosophy, with this data, with the right first party foundation, the ROI should go up, overall revenue should go up with lower costs and higher results. So what we just discussed are four steps, two foundational data steps, an audience step, process step, and finally, as a last step, how do we actually make sure that all of this works? What I would advocate for is that you periodically look at your customer file. You connect all the new and net new customers that you are bringing to the brand with the kinds of activities that you were executing against those customers. As an example, I'll lose that example just to make it very tangible from the prior page. So let's imagine that we are this brand and right now 14% of our customers are high value customers. After one year, this 14% as share of the pie should go up to let's say 16% or 18% where every incremental customer is worth two, three times more than the rest of the file. If that can happen, you're proving to yourself and your team that you have a bigger impact because every of the customers you brought in, a handful are increasingly being brought in with higher and higher future predicted potential value. So this last step is really just a way to be, be a truth serum to all the other steps, to confirmation that in fact you are driving higher value. So in closing, I do hope that you will walk away with at least one tactical idea that you can implement tomorrow. Please remember, these ideas do not have to be sequential. You can kind of enter this flywheel from any point and you can move backwards or forward to have impact. If you want to talk to me, I'm available at greg at delvedeeper.com and I'll happily share with you this deck and I'll happily schedule a one-on-one -on -one with you to go and kind of help make this more relatable to your current situation. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Greg. So as mentioned, we do have time to take some questions and we'll get to as many of them as we can over the next five to 10 minutes. Now, if we don't get to your questions, we always make sure they get forwarded over to our sponsor so they have the possibility to you know, reply offline. But first, just a couple quick reminders before we jump in. Today's webinar has been recorded and it will be available on demand later this afternoon. We'll be emailing everyone a link to the recording. And if you want to get a copy of today's slides, which I'm sure you will, there's tons of great information I want to spend some time with, you'll find a PDF in the event resources area at the top of your screen. So let us jump into these questions. We've got a bunch here. So Greg, the first question I have for you as I, I dig into all these questions, they are coming in fierce and fast. Now, you talked a lot about, you know, the high value customer, how they are really, really important. Now, someone writes, uh, let's say that the Pareto principle applies to my business. If I were to cut 80% of my customers, I'm still going to forego 20% of my revenue. Now, is, is that what you were advising or was there something else that you were trying to get to the core of? That's actually a really good question. Yeah, so look, I, I used to manage marketing for Bath & Body Works. Granted, that was you know about 15 years ago, but if you came to me and you told me, Greg, focus your efforts on the 20%, cut 80% of your, of your efforts, and, but that will cost you 20% of your revenue, that would not be an acceptable approach. So I am not advocating that we completely cut, kind of go cold, cold turkey on that 80% that are lower value. I am advocating that we philosophically make a shift towards some of that budget that's spent on 80% being reallocated to activities that increase the share of the 20%. So it's, it's more about shifting focus in a really intentional way towards acquisition and nurturing of high value customers and making it 20% that's proverbial, it would be different for every brand, bigger as a share. It's not about you know cutting off the 80% because 
yeah, it's 20% of your revenue. It's still 20% of your revenue. You still want to keep that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense to me. So we have another question. They ask, what if I have a strong data science team, but I don't have that marketing minded leader on the team? You know, what can I do? Yeah, so that, that, that's a really good one. Um, I mean, I do find that, look, the perfect situation is one where I have a data science leader who maybe has never been in a marketing seat, but has interacted with marketing business problems for many years. So that, that's something that does happen and, and you can find people like that. But if you have a data science lead, leader that's coachable and, and hopefully self-aware, someone who actually wants to work with you, partner with you, maybe even learn from you, who looks at you as a coach, they can help them become a better practitioner in terms of the application of data science to solving marketing problems. I think that that's a completely acceptable scenario. I think that the key there is coachability. Like if you have a data science leader that is coachable and curious, you can do anything with someone like that. But you need to then lean in and you owe it to that person to educate them and coach them on your, on your frictions, on your objectives, on what it is that you would like to see in terms of insight. You can't expect them just to like magically you know, wave a wand and come up with some insights without you actually providing the context for the need behind those insights. So coachability, I think is a key to like unlocking value, for working it side by side with that uh, data science leader. Great. All right, my next question. This individual, individual says, I think paying for all the data and tech is a new concept to apply to ROIs. So how do we help explain and sell in this idea to our brands? How do we get that buy-in? Yeah, look, that's, that's a really good one, right? Um, the, the problem I'm facing often is that data and tech are seen as non-working capital. And, you know, digital marketing, for example, or any media dollars, I see are seen as actually the working capital. So I don't know that one can change the mindset. Here's how I would do it. And here's how I've seen it done. It's all about delivering quick wins with smaller investments, building internal trust with two, three projects, showing immediate value and building up to a bigger pitch. So yes, you know, for, for a large data lake project that could be half a million dollars to a million dollars. That's a big investment. It's hard to ask for an investment like that, especially if the leadership at the brand that we're working for doesn't really get it. They don't really, you know, they're not educated about the role of first party data. They don't really have that like acumen. Mm -hmm. So how can I convince them to spend half a million dollars on a project like this? Yes. And especially now in this facing economic uncertainty. So again, Maybe there is a way to spend $50,000 or $75,000, get some early wins, show how that, get that generated $300,000 in value or how time to insight is faster now, or we have more accurate, trustworthy recommendations. And then you do another 50K budget, a project, a third one. And actually all those projects without that being really obvious, move you further towards getting to that one unified environment when all the data is, is tied in that customer ID. So there's a way to break this project that's a little overwhelming and expensive into smaller chunks, show value at every step, and almost like work up the internal awareness at the company in smaller, easier to digest chunks mm -hmm. where that awareness will simply increase and the appreciation and the impact that you have will increase and thus your seat at the table will also open up. Great. So this next question, I feel actually kind of piggybacks nicely after what I just asked. Now you talk a lot about investment. This individual says, you know, they would love your thoughts on how smaller companies with fewer resources can activate this process. So you addressed investments, but what are maybe some other things that these smaller companies that don't have these resources, yeah. what are some things they could do? Yeah, and I see the question from, from uh, one of our participants. So look, let me put it this way. I think that if we think about this idea of 
data is the currency, which you know has been around for forever. Uh, but if we believe that without making any additional data and technology investments, we can still squeeze value from what we have. What I would advocate is do not create the data lake. Do not go down that path because that does require a certain amount of like internal buying and conviction. But maybe there is a way to look at a handful of data sets. For example, every brand I talk to has a CRM system. That system shows you who is the customer, where they live, what was their email address, what did they purchase, at what price. Are you right now leaning on that existing data to create analysis that shows who my highest value customers are? To understand if someone buys you know, yellow shoes, are they buying a yellow t-shirt a month later? So you may be able to generate interesting insights and start having interesting conversations internally that down the road will be transformative just by doing more intentional analysis around your current CRM data. I don't think that many brands do that. Now, that's not a technology problem or a data problem. It's a people problem. You have to have someone who can come in, understand this data, understand the kinds of use cases that matter to you, and provide that insight. So that's a way to, if you're working for a smaller company, to generate these insights without making any like more, you know, expensive data and technology investments. Because again, if you do this for six, you know, 12 months, maybe that again will increase the internal awareness. And in 12 months, the CFO, the CEO will pull the trigger on a bigger investment because you've proven the value. Absolutely. That is some great advice. So with that, that is all the time that we have for questions. I'd like to thank our speaker, Greg, as well as our sponsor, Delve. Some final reminders, make sure you download the slides from event resources and check your email for a link to the on-demand recording. And if you enjoyed today's webinar, please check out the Adweek webinars calendar at adweek.com slash webinars. Again, big thank you to Greg. You gave a ton of information in our time today. And an even bigger thank you to our audience for taking time out of your day to join us. We look forward to seeing everyone at an upcoming Adweek webinar. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much.